Hello, trigonometry students. Welcome to my presentation of the review for your test two. All right, so we're going to jump just right in to this then. So a lot of the test will have to do with graphing. There's probably half of it has to do with graphing. The other half has to do with trig identities, what we've learned so far. So uh, one thing that you want to know how to do is if you've got a sine or a cosine, you want to be able to find out all the information about it, the period, the amplitude, phase shift, vertical translation, and that kind of thing. So one thing I want to just write on here real quick is the general form goes like this. A, and it could be a sine or a cosine. If it's in a factored form, then we say B, X minus C plus D. So let me just kind of remind you what everything is then. Well, the absolute value of A we learned is the amplitude. So one thing you want to remember is the amplitude is always a positive number, right? Uh, the period comes from that number B. Now, if you're dealing with a cosine or a sine, then the period, and actually the formula for a period for all trig functions, except the tangent and cotangent, is 2 pi over B. And again, there's always a positive answer to this. Um, so you're looking at that B number right there. If you're in a factored form, and it's important that if you're in a factored form, then C is the phase shift. Okay, so C is going to be the phase shift. The sign in front is going to tell you which way it goes. So if it was a minus C, that would take you to the right. If it was a plus C, that would take you to the left. Okay, so you're looking at that number right there. And then the D is a vertical translation. So it's up if that's a positive, and it's down if you're subtracting like that. So you want to be really clear on what those, what A, B, C, and D mean in the context of this problem. So the first thing we're going to do is, this is not in a factored form. Factored form, you're always going to have a number and then a parentheses x minus something. So what you have to do is you have to factor out the 3 pi like that. Okay, so let's just do that. It's easy to do. Just bring everything down. We got negative 2 thirds, cosine. Now I would recommend putting a bracket, put a 3 pi, and then kind of putting it together like that. Um, now you just got to figure out what goes inside. Well, this is the easy part right here. That's got to be an x because 3 pi x is 3 pi x. If you struggle figuring out what that is in your head, then all you really have to do is take that 6 pi and divide it by that common factor. And then that will tell you what goes there. So we'll insert the 2 in there. And it's really important that when you do this, if you factor this, you want to make sure you've done it correctly. All right, just multiply it out. See, 3 pi times x is 3 pi x. 3 pi times 2 is 6 pi, so it checks out. So that would be the factored form. You want to be sure that you know how to put that in a factored form. Now we can start figuring everything out. Well, the period is, again, 2 pi over absolute value of b. b in this problem is the 3 pi. Okay, so we just have 2 pi over 3 pi, which is a positive number anyway. So you get 2 pi over 3 pi, the pi's cancel out. So your period is going to be 2 thirds, okay? So that's what you would get for that then. Okay, the amplitude is this number, absolute value of that. So we would be doing absolute value of negative 2 thirds. So that is 2 thirds. Just remember the period and amplitude are always positive numbers because they're really measurements of distance. Okay, the vertical translation is this number, so that would be up 3, because it's positive, and then the phase shift is this number, so that would be 2, since that's a minus, then that is to the right. Okay, so you want to make sure that you know how to do that, um, you know, for, for any trig function, really, but particularly sine and cosine, put it in a factored form, be able to find these important parts of this. You'll do a lot more of this when you're doing graphing. All right, so let's move on to the next thing here. Um, anytime in this recording, if you want to pause and kind of rewind or, or write things down, then you can do that, okay? All right, so next thing is just some reminders about some things here. 
So the range of a tangent. Now what would help you to understand this problem is what the graph of a tangent looks like. So just recall that the graph of a tangent goes like this. You have asymptotes, and I'm not going to draw this very accurately because it doesn't really matter, but one period of a tangent looks like that. And remember the range is the y values. So basically on this, that would be all real numbers. Okay, you're just thinking about in the graph of this function, y equals tangent of x, that uh, what values do you get? Well, everything. Okay, there's y goes through the entire, uh, entire infinity from negative infinity to infinity. So it can be anything. Okay, uh, same kind of thing with the cosine. And, and this, by the way, would apply to a cotangent also. Same would be the answer for a cotangent. Okay. And the next one, sine, this would also go with a sine or, or cosine. Well, this is just the domain, and the domain, without drawing this real accurately, a cosine graph go, kind of goes like that, but it goes on forever. And there's no gaps or anything, and the domain is looking for x values. So x can be anything, so that would be all real numbers like that. Okay? All right, now... This next problem, let me explain how you could figure this out. Uh, and when you're talking about the range on this next problem, you're talking about, well, what can y be? So here's the way I want you to look at this problem, okay? If you had uh, y equals cosine x, I would hope that you would know that the range of that in interval notation is negative 1 to 1. But what we're doing is we're changing things, okay? We're changing that amplitude to 3, and we're moving up 5. So we're going up 5, then we have that amplitude of 3. Well, this is all you got to do on this, is just take the, the negative 1 and multiply it by 3 and add 5, and that will give negative 3 plus 5, so that gives 2. So the lowest value is now going to translate to 2. Then you take 3 times the upper value, 1, plus 5, and then that'll give 3 plus 5, that'll give 8. So the range on that would be from 3 to 8. That's a real easy way to reason that out. If it was a sign, you could do that the same way. You know, if there's an amplitude, that's going to change that. If there's an up-down transformation, that's going to change that. Now, like a period change isn't going to change the range. A phase shift isn't going to change the range. But an amplitude and vertical translation will, okay? All right, now the next thing I wanted to review is what are the range of the inverse trig functions? These are the three that we focused on the most. So you just, these are things you just want to know. In radians, uh, the inverse sign is going to be negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. We learned in class why that was. That's just an important thing to know. Uh, the inverse cosine is 0 to pi. And then the inverse tangent, a little bit different than the sine, it's got parentheses. And the reason it has parentheses around pi over 2 and negative pi over 2 is because the tangent is undefined there. Okay, like if you look at this unit circle that I've got here, what I want you to notice on this is that pi over 2, remember the tangent of an angle theta is y over x, so it would be 1 over 0. Okay, so you're undefined there, so that would not be included in that range. One thing that you want to kind of think about is um, when you're doing a range of an inverse sine, you're falling from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, so think of that as being quadrant runner 4. Think of uh, the inverse tangent being the same way. And then think of an inverse cosine from 0 to pi, that would be quadrants 1 or quadrants 2. Okay. So it's very, very important to know those ranges because that will help you to figure out inverse trig functions, which is something that you'll be reviewing and studying. Okay, let's go down the bottom. All of these things right here we're going to do really without the unit circle. You don't have to have the unit circle to even figure this out. But if you wanted to, let me just kind of explain how this would work. This part right here, if you're doing an inverse cosine, this is saying a cosine of some angle is one half. Okay, well remember the range of an inverse cosine is 0 to pi. Okay, so where does the cosine equal a half? 
right there at pi over 3. So what this would really mean is that theta is pi over 3. All right, so what we're going to do now is we would turn around and we would just do the cosine of pi over 3. Well, the cosine of pi over 3 is a half. So the answer is 0.5 or 1 half. Okay, we're going to kind of see a pattern on this, and you can do this real quickly. Okay, but you could reason that out if, if you could on a unit circle and forgot. We could do the next one the same way. Uh, this one uh, would mean that the tangent of theta equals negative 1. And I'm going to put that over 1 and recall that the tangent's y over x. Now what you have to do in this is remember the range, you're going from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So if you're dealing with an inverse tangent, your angles are not out here. They're between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, like that. So in this case, the place where this would happen would be here, okay, because y would be negative root 2 over 2, x would be root 2 over 2. So you would have not 7 pi over 4, you would have negative pi over 4 because you have to fall within that range of negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. 7 pi over 4 is out of range. So that's what theta is, okay? Now if you go back to the problem, what you're doing is you're just going back now and doing the inverse tangent of that, of, uh, I'm sorry, the tangent of negative pi over 4. Well, okay, negative pi over 4 is here at 315, so it would be y over x, so it'd still be negative 1. So I want you to notice on this, what's happening is the answer, it's just kind of undoing itself. And that's the way it works if the trig function is in this order. Now, if it's inverse cosine of cosine, then it's a little different, okay? And then this part C is different also. So in this case, you know, this is automatic. So if you came across something like, um, say, the sine of the inverse sine of 0.75, even though 0.75 you couldn't look up on the unit circle, it's still 0.75. That's automatic, but don't get it backwards. If it goes inverse sine of sine of, say, something like 30 degrees, it's not, the answer is not necessarily going to be 30 degrees. It may or it may not be. Okay, so that's important. Okay, now let me talk about this next one here. So this one right here, I think a lot of students would not be thinking and they'd just say, ah, it's 3.5. No, it isn't. So here's why. If you were to look on a unit circle over here, let me erase some of this mess over here. So if you were going to look up an inverse sine of 3.5, let me show you what would happen. This part right here, what that means is this means the sine of theta is 3.5. You would be looking on the unit circle to find where a y value would be 3.5. You're never going to find it because this is the largest y value. So it's impossible, okay? So this one basically would have no solution. Or you could say undefined if you want to. There's just no solution to that. Okay? There's no angle. There is no such thing. The inverse uh, sine of 3.5 is undefined. So you could put undefined on there too. So don't fall for that, okay? The thing is, this the, you have to be able to get a solution to what's inside. If you can't get a solution to what's inside, then you can't get an answer. Another example would be the tangent of the inverse tangent of negative pi over 2. Okay, well, the thing on that is, uh, not negative pi over 2, I'm sorry, that's not what I meant to say. Um, I, what I was trying to say is I'm trying to come up with something that would be pretty simple to see. Another one would be something like, uh, cosine of inverse cosine, say, of negative 1.1. Okay, that's also undefined because the smallest value a cosine ever hits is negative 1. So that would be undefined because there's no solution to that. So the point is, if that in, inner parenthesis, if that inverse trig function has no solution, then the problem has no solution. Okay, so be cautious about that. Okay, now I'm going to move to the next page here, and we're going to work these out. This is, again, working a little bit with inverse trig functions. These problems right here, you don't need a calculator for anything on this exam, by the way. 
And um, the thing with this is, you don't need your calculator to figure this out. The way you want to start this off is kind of like this. I would just start by looking at this inner term right here. And I would write down what that means. What that means is the sine of some angle theta is 3 over 5. Okay? Next thing you want to think about is, well, what is the sine? You want to know your, your trig definitions. That sine's y over r, cosine's x over r, tangent is y over x, cosecant r over y, secant y over x, I'm not, nope, 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 y over r, oh, nope, 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 <laughs> I'm going too fast. Okay, uh, secant is r over x, and then tangent is x over y. So you want to make sure that you know those things, because if you don't know those, you're going to get lost in a problem like this. You wouldn't be able to solve it. So since we know that the sine is y over r, it looks like y is 3 and r is 5. Now the quadrant's real important, and the way you figure out this quadrant is you do this. Well, what you have to know is you have to know that the range of an inverse sine is in radians from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Okay, so that means that, well, you only got two choices. You're either in quadrant 1 or you're in quadrant 4. That's it. Well. Since y is positive, remember if you're in quadrant 1, x is positive and y is positive, that means that you have to be in quadrant 1 in this problem. If that was a negative 3 fifths, then you'd be in quadrant 4. So what that means is since we're in quadrant 1, x is positive, y is positive, and r is always positive. Okay, that's, that's always a positive value. So we would have that. Now, so what we know is we know that uh, y is 3, r is 5. Now we need to just figure out x. We figure out x by the Pythagorean relationship. Or you might already know what the answer is if you know some of your Pythagorean triples. So we would have x squared plus 3 squared equals 5 squared. So that's x squared plus 9 equals 25. You could subtract 9 from both sides. You would get x squared equals 16. Square root both sides, you're going to have x equals plus minus 4. But since we're in quadrant 1, we know that that's going to be positive 4. Okay. Now what we're doing now to get the final answer is we're asked to do the secant. Well, the secant by definition is r over x. Therefore, that would be 5 over 4 would be the final answer to that problem. So that's how you figure that out. You've got to consider all those things. You've got to know... The definitions of the trig functions, you've got to know the range of the inverse trig functions in order to figure out the quadrant you're in. And once you know the quadrant, you're going to know the sine of x and y. Okay, so that's why I think through that problem. Okay, next one. Let's see. Let's take a look at this. We're going to do exactly the same way. Same thought process. Okay, start by looking at this. That The meaning of that statement is the cosine of some angle theta is negative 12 thirteenths. We don't know what that angle is, and it turns out it doesn't matter what that angle is. What matters is the cosine, by definition, is x over r. Okay? So one thing that we knew in this problem immediately is r is 13, x is negative 12. Remember, r is always positive. So that just means we've got to find y, but we do need to consider what quadrant we're in. So when you figure out the quadrant, this is the most common place where students make mistakes, is the range of an inverse cosine is 0 to pi, like that. So we're either in quadrant 1 or we're in quadrant 2. Well, since x is negative, that means that we are in quadrant 2 for that reason. And that means that in quadrant 2, x is negative and y is positive. Okay, so now we got it made. Okay, now the other thing you got to know, of course, is the Pythagorean relationship. So now you do this. So this is just going to be negative 12 squared plus y squared equals 13 squared. This will be 144 plus y squared equals 169. Um, I have oftentimes had a problem like this on an exam, and I was surprised 
how many students could not figure out that 13 squared was 169. I mean, you got to know how to do um, multiplication, you know, without a calculator. You can't get relying on pressing buttons your entire life. So, you know, know how to do that. So now we got y squared equals 25. Square root both sides, so see that would give y equals plus minus 5. But since we're in quadrant 2, that would make that a plus 5. Okay, now we're ready to get the answer to the problem, see. So the problem, we're asked, for, we're asked for what the cotangent is. The cotangent's x over y, so that means we would just have negative 12 over 5 would be the answer to the problem. Okay? That's how you figure that out. Um, um, those kind of problems are test students on a lot of things, so it's kind of a good question to ask. It's very thoughtful. Okay, now the next part of this review I'm going to go through is the graphing. So pause if you need to, and we're going to go through about six different graphs. I'm just going to do an example of each trig function in this graph. Uh, on your exam, I do not give you a unit circle. You will uh, be given a blank unit circle to fill out if you want to. But uh, if you don't want to take the time to fill it out, you don't have to, because you may find it just as easy to, to, to uh, figure out whichever point you're on, just kind of figure things out as you go. But a lot of students like to just fill out the unit circle first five minutes of the test and then go from there. That's up to you, but I don't give you a unit circle. All right, so the first thing on this problem is we need to figure out all of this information. So you're given two cosine x minus three, okay? And again, uh, when you're looking at a problem like this, you have a cosine bx and then really minus c. So you have a, b, and c there, the period you have to know that the period is for a cosine is the formula 2 pi over absolute value of b. Well, b is 1 half, so you're really doing 2 pi divided by a half. Well, okay, it's a good, good idea to write it that way. So what you're doing is you have 2 pi times 2. You divide fractions by multiplying by the reciprocal. So the period has changed from 2 pi to 4 pi. Okay, so that's the first thing you want to know, okay? And then the amplitude is just this number in front, so the amplitude is going to be 2, so that takes care of that. All right, we have that. And then the increment is real important, and the increment is what's telling you how to figure out the x-axis. So what you do is you always just take the period, and you take one-fourth of it. So you can take the period, uh, period over 4, is what the increment is. So we just do 4 pi over 4. So that'll give pi. Now the increment is always the same on all six trig functions. It's always the same. So now what we're going to do is the problem says let's graph from negative 2 pi to 2 pi. Well, let's go ahead and let's put our, our increment on here. Okay, so I'm going to just start counting by pi pi, 2 pi. You can go further if you want to, but you don't have to. Uh, all I'd be grading is this interval here. Then I'm going to go negative pi, negative 2 pi like that. And then your y-axis. The way I look at this y-axis is instead of going up 1, it's going to go up 2 because you have an amplitude of 2, but then everything goes down 3. So you're going to have to go down maybe 5 or 6 like this you're going to have a graph that is shifted down. So you can go ahead and set it up. You know, you, this, this would be fine if you set it up like that. Now, what happens on this problem, it, it's up to you. What I do on an exam is I only grade the last piece of this, the final result. So a lot of students might find it effective to do this in two stages. That's what I've been trying to teach you. So if you have y equals 2 cosine, 1 half x minus 3, to me, it's real easy to just work with everything except the translation first because it's super easy to do. This is all you have to know. What you have to know is a basic cosine. If we were graphing y equals cosine of x, and you don't even really have to know where these x values are. You just need to know that you know it starts at 1 and it cycles through 
these points like that. That's how a basic cosine goes. So there's no phase shift on this or anything. So that means your first point would be here. However, the amplitude's two, so it would move there. Okay? Then you would just start cycling through these points. So then it would go there, just like here. Then it would go down to its minimum of negative two because the amplitude changed. Then you could just cycle through these points like this. Now, this is not the final graph, but if you feel like as a student you need to do this in more than one step, then I'm totally fine with that. So, and I think that's kind of the way a lot of students seem to prefer to do this. So what I just graphed is two cosine, one half at, whoops, need to write that better. And then of course now we just got to do the vertical translation. So the graph that I just drew on here is uh, y equals two cosine one half x. Now if you choose to do it this way, just be sure you label it. You know, use different colored pens, use a dashed line for that. Now the last thing we're going to do on this is we have a vertical translation of minus three. So everything goes down negative three. This is neg has a y value of negative two. Negative 2 minus 3 is going to go down to negative 5. This is 0. 0 minus 3 goes down to negative 3. This is 2. 2 minus 3 goes to negative 1, and so forth. Okay, then you've got a super accurate graph. You've got five key points. So that's how that would look then. Okay? All right, so that's how that goes. It's not that hard to learn how to graph once you catch on to it. And if you have the basic sine and cosine memorized, which you need to have, then it makes graphing pretty simple if you follow this procedure on this. The other thing I want to mention on at least some of these problems is you could check your answer, you know, very easily just by picking, uh, you know, x values. Now, you would want to pick x values on your increment. So let's just start by picking x equals 0. And then let's do one more. Let's say x equals pi. Well, if you plug into the original problem, you would have y equals 2 cosine 1 half times 0 minus 3. Now, that is not that hard to figure out. I mean, this is really just 2 cosine of 0 minus 3 because a half times 0 is 0. Well, the cosine of 0 is 1, okay? So you would have 2 times 1 minus 3, so you'd have negative 1. So notice this point has a y value of negative 1. So that checked. Okay, now go to pi. Okay, now it would be y equals 2 cosine of 1 half pi minus 3. Okay, well, pi over 2, the cosine is 0. Okay, it's the x value on your unit circle. So this would be 2 times 0 minus 3, which is negative 3. Now, well, sure enough, that's what that is. Okay, so it's really not that hard to check a few points. And to me, if you check maybe two points, you're, you're probably in pretty good shape. Even if you check one, that's better than nothing. And when you check these things, by the way, they'll always be on the unit circle. I mean, they always will if you get your increment right. That's just kind of the way all this st stuff works out. Okay? All right, so let's go to the next thing. Let's do a cotangent. Okay, the approach on a uh, cotangent is you know quite a bit different than it is on a sine or cosine. So let's talk about uh, how we would manage this sort of problem. The first thing is, if you have a tangent or you have a cotangent, then the, the formula for the period is different. The period is pi over b. So you have to be aware of that. So let's go ahead and do that. B is always the number. Oops, battery's about to die, so let me get plugged in here. There we go. Okay, so B would be 4. So the period would just be pi over 4. Okay, so we got that. Got to know formulas. I don't give you any of these formulas. Okay, so increment is always the period divided by 4. Or if you want to do time, or you can do one-fourth times the period. It means the same thing. That's what I'm going to do on this. I'm going to take pi over 4, and I'm going to multiply that by one-fourth. So if I go straight across, then I have pi over 16. So that's going to tell us 
that the x-axis needs to be incremented and go by pi over 16. So if you were counting that out, it would just go 1 pi over 16, 2 pi over 16, 3 pi over 16, 4 pi over 16, and so forth. Of course, you want to reduce fractions. So 2, pi, 2 over 16 would be pi over 8, and then 4 over 16 would be a fourth, so it would go like that. Okay, so that increment is so important on these problems because it tells you the x values where your five key points are going to be located. So we're going to graph this from negative pi over 4 to pi over 4. So when we do this, we've got, let's just start out, we have pi over 8. Then we go, whoop, nope, 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 that's not what we said. We said pi over 16. Okay, so we're going to increment by pi over 16. Second one is pi over 8 then 3 pi over 8, and then finally uh, pi over 4. And then we'll go backwards. And the question students ask, do I have to write all this? Yes, you have to. You won't get credit if you don't label what everything means on the x-axis. Everything. Okay, it's important. Okay, a graph's not a graph if you don't label the x-axis and everything. I call that scaling the x-axis. You have to label what that scale is. Okay, now one thing on this, you have the 3 in front of the cotangent, which is going to vertically stretch this. So it makes sense to go up bigger than 3. Let's go up to about 5 and then down to about negative 5. You can adjust that as you go if you feel like you need to. Okay, so what happens on a tangent or a cotangent, it's real important that you find a vertical asymptote. The way you do this on a cotangent is you set the argument equal to zero. Why? Okay, because if you look at zero radians on this unit circle, remember a cotangent of theta is x over y. Well, uh, so in this case it would be one over zero, so it's undefined. And when you're looking for an asymptote, you're figuring out where this function is undefined. So the argument is just this part that's in parentheses. So you're just going to set 4x equal to 0, solve that equation, and you will know where an asymptote is. And once you find one asymptote, you can count to find the next ones. Okay, I'll explain that in a minute. So divide by 4, so you would end up getting an asymptote at x equals 0. Now, what makes this easy, and that's the way it's always going to work on a cotangent, is just set that argument to zero. If you can solve that equation effectively, then you got it made. So here's what you want to do. On your graph, just go ahead and put a vertical asymptote. Just kind of dash in the y-axis like that. Now count like this. One, two, three, four, five. That's where your next asymptote is. Now when you count, you should have three places in the middle. There's three important problems in the middle of the uh, points in front of, in the middle of the asymptotes. Go the other way. One, two, three, four, five. Notice when I counted, I was counting the original asymptote. So I'll do that one more time. One, two, three, four, five, like that. Okay. That's all you got to do to find your next asymptotes. Now what you want to do on a cotangent, you really want to memorize one key thing about a cotangent. Okay? And it doesn't even matter what the x values are on this, but a cotangent basically goes like this. This is the structure. Like I said, it doesn't really matter what these x values on the, on the cotangent are for what I'm trying to show you. It's just if you count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you'll continue to have this shape. An asymptote, three points in the middle. Now all you really got to remember on a cotangent is the three points go like this. Halfway in the middle, the y value is 0. This point, the y value is 1. This point, the y value is negative 1. So just think of y is 1, y is 0, y is negative 1. And then you know that the graph of a cotangent has that shape. So all in the world you have to do on this is we are graphing 
y equals 3 cotangent of 4x. The 4x took care of where, of how the increment changed, because the period changed, and it took care of where those asymptotes are and where those key points are. So now all you got to do is this. Okay, that first key point is 1. So you do 3 times 1. So 3 times 1 is equal to 3. So that means this point is now up 3. It starts 1, but it goes up 3 now because it stretches. Then you go 3 times 0. Okay, 3 times 0 is 0. So that point goes there now. Okay, the next point, negative 1. So you go 3 times negative 1 to get negative 3. So that point will be down 3. Now the rest of it, you just sketch. Just make sure that you show that it's approaching the vertical asymptotes but not touching it. And that's how that would go. If you, and then this is just repetition here. Um, you know, once you get one period, it's easy to get a second period because it's the same. Okay, so that would be how that graph goes. So it's real important that you understand in order 1, 0, negative 1 as the y values in the middle of the asymptotes on a basic cotangent. And then it's real easy to adjust. If you had like um, a vertical translation, then you would uh, figure that in also. Okay. So now the last thing we want to do is we want to look at the equations of the vertical asymptotes. There's two ways to do this. One way is just write out where they were. So on this problem, you had a vertical asymptote at negative 1 pi over 4, 0 pi over 4, or just 0. I like to do it this way, though. And then 1 pi over 4. Now, if you were to go through and count on this further, and I'll go back up here and show you. See, if we continue to go 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, we would just go 5 pi, 6 pi, 7 pi, 8 pi over 16, and we'd be back to another asymptote. So what you would have here is you would have, and again, counting to 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that would actually be pi over uh, 2 or 2 pi over 4. So when I, what you're going to see on here is the asymptotes are going to go like this. 1 pi over 4, 2 pi over 4. Now it's a real easy pattern to see. It's like that. Now, pi over 4 is always there. That's why I reduced this 8 over 16 to 2 over 4 instead of 1 half. Okay, because I want you to see that you always have pi over 4. So the equation of the asymptote, you would just say x equals k pi over 4. And then what kind of number is k? 0, 1, 2, 3. That's an integer. So we would say k is an integer. And you do have to say that. You can't just say, you can't uh, get a correct answer unless you tell me what k is. I have to know, all right? So that's how that goes. The other way that you could do this now is uh, there's a formula, and you could do this if you want to. The formula goes like this. You could say x equals wherever a vertical asymptote is plus the period times k, where k is an integer. So if you did it this way, you can pick any vertical asymptote. I'd pick 0. The period was pi over 4 times k. So that always works. Just pick an asymptote plus the period times k, where k is always an integer if you use this formula. So that'll always work. OK, that's it. Study that hard. OK, let's move on to the next thing here. See where I am on the recording. So I'm probably going to do this recording in two parts. I'll do the. I'll go ahead and finish up the graphs, and then I'll do a second part that has more of the identities in it. Okay. Now we're going to move on to a secant. Okay. So in this particular problem, now remember the the formula for secant, cosecant, sine, and cosine. The period is always 2 pi over b on the cotangent and the tangent, it's pi over b. Okay, so you want to know that. So in this particular problem, it's already in a factored form. b is 2, so the period is just going to be uh, 2 pi over 2, so that's going to be pi. 
Okay, so we've got the period figured out. That's always a good place to start. Okay, uh, let's see. The increment is always the period over 4. So the period's pi. Divide by 4. We have pi over 4. Okay, so we have that. Okay, the phase shift, if you're in a factored form, is that number right there. Since that's a plus, that tells you to go to the left. So we would just have, and you can write it, you can either write it as negative 3 pi over 4, or you could just say 3 pi over 4 to the left. Okay, generally if you're going to the left on that, you use a negative number for the phase shift. Okay, but I do want you to know, it's important in your graph that you know whether the phase shift is left or right. Okay, so that's kind of how we start with that, is we figure out, you know, these things right here. Okay, the equations of the vertical asymptotes, I would, that would always be the last thing I do on this problem. I wouldn't even go there yet. It's not even necessary. So what I'm going to do next is we're going to go ahead and let's write out our increments. So the increment is... Um, was pi over 4. So let's just kind of write this out. Start at 0, you would have 1 pi over 4, 2 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 4 pi over 4. You can go as far as you want to. All we're going to do is graph maybe one period on this. I would only grade one period on there. But if you want to do more, you could. So I'm just going to go the x-axis like this. So it's pi over 4. 2 pi over 4 is really pi over 2, so you do want to record that in the reduced form, because I'll take off if you don't. Then we have 3 pi over 4, and then 4 pi over 4 is just pi. So that's probably good enough. We're going to look for five key points, and then I'll review kind of how you do that. Yes, all these things have to be labeled. And why? Because sometimes students don't know how to count out the increment. You know, that's basically something you have to know, and your graph wouldn't be accurate if it wasn't labeled. Okay, so now let's do the y-axis. We have a half there. Since you have a half, that changes the amplitude on a cosine. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to me maybe to just go all the way up to, well, I'd probably go up a little higher because of the way the graph goes. So let's do something like this. One, two, three. And then maybe we can subdivide those things into halves like that. And then, the, uh, then we'll go 1, 2, negative 3, and then subdivide further like that. Okay? All right, now, what do we do on a secant? Okay, well, a secant is a reciprocal of a cosine. So what you really want to do is you want to get the graph of y equals negative 1 half cosine of 2 times x plus 3 pi over 4. Now, you can do this in one step. And your goal would be able to do this in one step. So the thing is, you want to start, if you have a phase shift, that's where you start. So we're going to start at negative 3 pi over 4. Okay, so we're going to move over here. Now, here's what happens on this problem. Now, you can do this. When you do, when you do your graph, you could do this, okay? Before we even figure out that negative one-half, if you needed to do this, you could do this. Just very lightly, with a pencil, you could go through these, these key points like this. Because this is how we know a cosine goes. Max of one, min of negative one, like that. Now, what you could do now is all you got to do now is just multiply y by negative one-half. You can do that in your head and you can do it easily. Okay, so in this case you would go negative one-half times one would be negative one-half. So that point is now there and you could just erase that original point if you wanted to. Okay, the next thing is y is zero, so uh, negative one-half times zero is still zero, so that point is set. Okay, you can go to this point which is negative one so negative one-half times negative one is uh, positive one-half, so that point moves there, okay? And once you get kind of the hang of doing that, then you got it made, okay? Then you're going to get the same result here, and you're going to get the same result there, and then there's your five key points right there, see? 
Okay, so all that did is it just flipped and kind of shrunk. And then that's it. All we're going to do is one period. So we've got five key points established. You can go further if you want to, so that's it. Okay, so we graph the cosine. Once you graph the cosine, then you want to remember that the vertical asymptotes occur at midpoints. Okay, so when we do this, the midpoints are here. I don't know what I mean by the midpoints. Those are half, halfway between the max and min. So your midpoints would be here, like that. And then you can just sketch, okay? We know that we have that U shape. This makes, if it's on the maximum, it goes up. The minimum, the U shape goes down. So that would be a good graph right there, okay? That's the idea. Now, if you want to look at your asymptotes, start looking for a pattern, okay? So we have negative pi over 2. We have 0 pi over 2. Well, what would happen from there is you would have 1 pi over 2. And every 2, what's going to happen on this is every time you count to 2, you're going to have an asymptote. So you would have one there and you would have one there. So you would get to pi. Now, pi could be thought of as 2 pi over 2 like that. So every time that pi over 2 goes by, you have an asymptote. So it's 1 pi over 2, 2 pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 4 pi over 2, and so forth. So that means your equation could be written as x equals k pi over 2, where k is an integer. Now you can use this, I taught this in class, instead of writing k as an integer, you can write that symbolism if you want to. That just means k is an element of the set of integers. That's how that goes. Okay, problem done. Now the other thing is there is a formula. If you would rather use the formula, I'm okay with that. There's an infinite number of ways to write equation of a vertical asymptote. I've given you the best way, but you could just go x equals a vertical asymptote plus one half the period times k, where k is an integer. Okay, so if you did it this way, you could say x equals well, your first asymptote is zero, and then you would have one half the period. The period in this problem was pi, so you just say one half times pi, k is an integer. Well, it's the same thing we got. <laughs> See, okay. Now I don't care what that first uh, what that first uh, vertical asymptote is. I mean, you probably want to use the smallest one. You know, if zero is an asymptote, certainly use that. If it isn't, use probably the smallest positive asymptote, but that'll get you something that works there. Okay, so as far as the domain goes, uh, the domain is kind of asks the question, what can x be? Well, x can be everything except an asymptote. So what you could say on this is the set of x such that x is not equal to an asymptote. Well, where are the asymptotes? k pi over 2, where k is an integer. Okay, so you can write that like that. Those two problems go together. All right? And by the way, if I asked for the range on this, well, the range would be the y value, so that would be on this problem, it would be negative infinity to negative 1 half union 1 half to infinity. So you've got a range from negative one half and above, from one half and above, and negative one half and below, for your y values. Okay, so that's how you reason through that problem. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and look at move on to the next page. I was gonna do six graphs, so that you had an example of each. So here's a sign. Okay, so on a sign, now this one is not in a factored form. So the way you want to start a problem like this. Let's go ahead and factor that pi out. So let's write that in a factored form. So we'd have y equals sine, draw a bracket, pi, blank set of parentheses, and then the plus 2 is outside of that. So we're kind of factoring the argument. So x would go there. That's pretty simple. Pi times x is pi x. Now what goes here, if you can't do it in your head, just do this. Take pi over 2 and divide it by whatever you factored out. Take pi over 2 divided by pi 
And if you can figure that out, you got it made. So that would be put the pi over 1. That would be pi over 2 times 1 over pi. Pi's cross out, so that means a half goes there. Okay, and then just check. It's real easy. Pi times x is pi x. Pi times a half is pi over 2. So now we're ready to figure everything out. Okay, so the period, the formula is 2 pi over b. And this problem, b is pi. So we have 2 pi over pi. Pi's cross out, you get 2. Students sometimes really freak out when pi cancels out. I have no idea why. You should like it if pi crosses out. Okay, that's it. So the period's 2. It's just a number. It doesn't have pi in it. Doesn't have to. Okay, the increment is the period over 4. So that would be 2 over 4, which would reduce to a half. So our x-axis needs to be incremented by a half. Okay, phase shift, it's got to be in the factored form, is going to be 1 half to the right. So once you get that in the factored form, then you'll be able to figure out those things like that then. Okay, now we're ready to rock and roll with our graph here. So when we get this put together, okay, our increment is a half. Just start counting by a half. You're counting by the numerator, counting by one. So it's one over two, two over two, three over two, four over two. Reduce your fractions. You can go out as far as you feel like you need to. So I'm just going to put a half. Two halves, of course, is one. And I got three halves. And 4 over 2 is 2. Now, see, 2 is the period. So you would have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 key points. Now, on this one, I think all you got to do is graph one period. You want to start at the phase shift. And you could go further if you wanted to. If you took that further out, you'd have 5 over 2. Um, or you could go to the left. It doesn't really matter which way you want to do that. So I'll probably on this one just kind of go both ways just to show you all I'm going to look for is one period so here's the idea all right now watch this real carefully now so we let's look at the factored form we have y is sine pi x minus a half plus two okay you want to start there okay now you could do this in two phases if you want to and I think this is probably the easiest thing for most students is just do everything except the up to. So I'm going to do this in two stages. So I'm going to graph y equals sine pi times x minus a half and just do that. And that'll be a dashed line. Okay, And I'm okay if you do this in one step. You do not have to do this in more than one step. So I'm just going to make this go up to 3 and this down to negative 3 like that. So here's all you got to know. Well, we start at the phase shift. Okay, so the phase shift is 1 half to the right. So we know a sign starts at 0, 0, the y value 0. So that means that first point would be just no longer there, but it would be at the phase shift. Then it would cycle through these points like this. Okay, now that's good enough. Or you could go backwards. Now you could also go backwards if you want to there, I just need to see five key points, you know, in order. So I'm just going to focus on this part right here. Okay, so we got that. Now, all that's going to happen now is now we're going to go up two on this problem. So it's real easy to do that in your head. All you're doing is taking the y values and adding two. So zero plus two is two. Then you're doing one plus two, which is three. Then zero plus two which is 2, then negative 1 plus 2, which is 1, and so forth. And then you've got your five key points right there. You got it made, okay? And you can do that in one step, because if you did it in one step, all you'd do is, okay, I know this point is here, but 0 plus 2 is 2. I know this point is 1, 1 plus 2 is 3, and then you could do it like that and just get the final answer, okay? And again, I encourage you to try to check at least one or two points on these problems. And I'm not going to do that on all these problems on here. I will go ahead and do it on this one since this has got a lot of things going on. So let's just check one point. I would just say x is a half. 
Why would I use x as a half? Because it's easy. It would make this zero. So you would have y equals sine of pi times one half minus a half plus two. Well, this whole thing right here would go to zero. So you'd have sine of zero plus two. Sine of zero is zero. Zero plus two is two. Look at that. The y value when x is a half, y is two. That's right. That's all you got to do. So I would encourage you to maybe at least check one point. Okay. All right. So that's it. Okay. Let's move on to the next thing. Let's do a cosecant. Okay. So when you're doing a cosecant, uh, you know, this is the one that has the U shapes or kind of, kind of go like that. Uh, when you have a, a cosecant, you really on this problem, you want to focus totally on the graph of the sine of one half x. Okay, if you can get that graph, then you got it made. Okay, so the formula for the period of the sine uh, and the cosecant is 2 pi over b. Okay, well b is a half, so you're doing 2 pi divided by a half. Therefore, that's 2 pi times 2 over 1. So the period is 4 pi. Okay, the increment is the period over 4. So we would just take the period 4 pi divided by 4, and we would get pi. So all that's going to tell us then is we just count out by pi. 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, and so forth. All right? So down on our graph, let's go ahead and get set up. No phase shift on this problem, so we're just going to go pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi. So when you get to 4 pi, you're at the end of the period. You only have to do one period on this problem, so it's good enough to just work here. You could go the other way, too, if you wanted to. Okay? All right. So we do that then. Now, uh, this particular problem should be real simple. The amplitude on that is 1. So really, you know, we need to go up a little higher than that so we can get that U-shape in there so we have that, okay? No phase shift, no vertical translation, so this one's a piece of cake, okay? A sine starts at 0, 0, then it hits its high point of Y equals 1, back there, then its low point, and then there. So this right here is the graph of y equals the sine of 1 half x. Okay, now what you want to do is the vertical asymptotes are at the midpoints. Okay, so the midpoints are right here. Okay, so just sketch in your asymptotes. So it looks like we have the x-axis, 2 pi, 4 pi. Now, see, they've got a pretty easy pattern on this now. All right? So we got that, and then the rest of it, you just sketch. Okay? The maximum, the U-shape goes up. The minimum, the U-shape goes down. There is one period. One, two, three, four, five key points. So that's it. Okay? All right, now the vertical asymptotes on this are pretty easy. It's just uh, 0 pi, 2 pi, 4 pi. What would be next? 6 pi, 8 pi, and so forth. So we would just say x equals k pi. And then this time, what is k? k is an even integer, because you're going 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. And then you're going negative 2, negative 4, and so forth like that. So that's it. OK, so we've got uh, our answers to that. And then the range is just going to be you know, what can y be, okay? So it looks like 1 to infinity, and then it would be like this, negative infinity to negative 1. Okay, so the green part of the graph is the cosecant, so that would be 1 and beyond and negative 1 and below. So we could write that as negative infinity to negative 1, union 1 to infinity. Problem done. Okay, it's not too hard. If all you have is a period change, it's, it's quite easy to do. Okay, I'm going to do one more graph, and then that'll close the video, and I'll get that posted, and then I'll record the second part. 
Okay, so let's take a look at a tangent. Now, tangent and cotangent have kind of a different methodology. Uh, anytime you have a tangent or a cotangent, first of all, the period is pi over b. So that's important. Remember, b is absolute value. Okay, so with this one, the period would be pi divided by 2 pi. b is the number in front of x. The pi's would divide out, so the period is 1 half. Okay, increment is always 1 fourth of the period, or the period divided by 4. This time, since the period's a half, I'm just going to multiply it by a fourth. That will give me an increment of 1 eighth. Okay, there's no phase shift on this, but there is a down 3 thing. So, what we'll do on this, you are given an interval on this, so we just count out the increments. So, I'm going to do this over here. 1 eighth, 2 eighth, 3 eighth, 4 eighth, like that. Okay, and then reduce the fractions. So, see, that would be a fourth. That would be a half. So, all we're asked to do on this, really, is to go like this. You can go out further if you want to. So I'm going to start by just getting this, and then that would give you one period. You'd have one, two, three, four, five key points. Okay, so that's how that goes. Now the key thing, whenever you're, whenever you're doing a tangent or a cotangent, is you always want to do this. Okay, you want to find just one vertical asymptote. And the way you do that on a tangent is you set the argument equal to pi over 2. Why pi over 2? Well, the tangent of an angle theta by definition is y over x. Well, at pi over 2, you get 1 over 0. So you're undefined. So an asymptote is where this tangent function is undefined. So the argument in this problem is 2 pi x. Set that equal to pi over 2, and if you can solve that equation effectively, then you've got one asymptote. Well, all you got to do on this is divide by 2 pi. I would think I would look at it as just multiply by 1 over 2 pi. That way, x, you solve for x, and then the pi's cross out, and then you'd have 1 over 4. So there's an asymptote. Okay? So you go down to your graph and you put a vertical asymptote at 1 fourth. And all you got to do is find 1. Now let's just count to 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There's your next asymptote. Okay. Basically there's always on a tangent and cotangent. Uh, you've got asymptotes and three points in the middle for one period. Okay. What you want to do now is you want to recall how the graph of y equals tangent x goes. Okay, so this is kind of what you learned about a basic tangent. Again, don't worry about what those x, where those x values are. You just learn basically that you have asymptotes at the beginning and end of the period, and then you learned the basic shape. You just got to remember these y values. So you have a point there, point there, a point there, and the structure of the graph looks like that. And what's key is the y value. So you have y equals 1, y equals 0, y equals negative 1. So that's what we're going to end up doing on this now. Now we do have a, a down 3 thing here. So let me kind of explain how I do this. So let's go ahead and just take the x and y axis, you know, down to 3 like that. So really all you got to remember is, okay, this point right here, we're expecting it to be negative 1, like it is here, but we subtract 3, so that will take you down to negative 4. Okay, so just take that down to negative 4 now. Okay, and that point's established. Now the point 0, same thing, y is 0, 0 minus 3 is negative 3. And then the point on the right is 1, so 1 minus 3 is negative 2. So these points here on a basic tangent all just got moved down 3. So that's how one period of your graph would go. Okay, that's it. Okay, now let me, uh, let me show you something on this. I'm going to 
just erase this thing right here for a second. You know, if you wanted to just check a point on this, I'd, I'd like to emphasize this a lot. Let's just say x is 0. Then we would have y equals the tangent of 2 pi times 0 minus 3. That would be tangent of 0 minus 3. The tangent of 0, since it's y over x, would be 0 over 1 would be 0. So you get 0 minus 3, you get negative 3. So notice if x is 0, y is negative 3. Checks. Okay, you can do the same thing with all five of those points if you wanted to. Okay, now that leaves us with the vertical asymptotes. The vertical asymptotes are on this, we have negative 1 over 4, 1 over 4. Now, if you look at how your increment goes, see your increment was going 1 8, 2 8. That's where an asymptote was. So then 3 8, 4 8, 5 8, 6 8 would be where the next one is because it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So you'd be at 3 fourths now. Now you'd probably start seeing the pattern. It's going to go like this x equals k over 4, and then k is an odd integer. Okay, so that's how that goes. All right, I'll wrap that up then. That's going to wrap up my recording. I'm going to go and get this posted, review, work problems out. It's always good when you prepare for a test to uh, pick, pick a problem. Don't look at anything. You know, watch my video to help you with the review, but later on, do problems. Do lots of problems. Okay, then you'll be good. In theory, anyway. All right, have a good one.